This morning I'm preaching on Still Amazed by His Grace. And I want Brother Aaron Bowley to come up and share a testimony of what God did amazed me last Sunday night. Give them a little history of what happened to you. He does have amazing grace, amen. As a lot of y'all know that I had a, I had fell at work and I I'd hurt myself pretty bad and uh, I've, I've been out of work for a few weeks, but I'm ready to get back because God's totally healed me, amen. Amen. God can take a slip disc, three bulging disc, a tear in the spine where my spinal fluid was leaking out and I had sacks and pastor felt them. They're gone, amen, because when I went back for the MRI, see, I showed them the MRI and I went to college right. to study the radiology and I was showing them where it was slipped out and I was showing them where it was bulging and I was showing them where the spinal fluid was and where it was supposed to be but when the doctor looked at the x-ray after we prayed amen can you believe God's grace fell and every, amen I'm telling you right now God put them discs back where they belonged that spinal fluid ran back up and I feel God I can touch my toes and I ain't got a pain I'm telling you right now he's amen. got grace if you just believe in God I'm telling you if he has that healing power I said he's got that healing power He's got some that no man's got. No doctor can heal me like my God can heal me. I can go to many physicians, but my God has grace. Woo! Glory be to God. He has grace, church. And I believe in healings. I said I believe in healings. My God, I was sitting around in the house. My wife was having to bathe me. She was having to dress me. My God, you're talking about a humbling experience because it was hard for me. I didn't want, I wanted to do it myself. But my God, I said, they prayed for me. I said, honey, I can get in the shower by myself. Honey, I can put my pants on myself. You ain't got to help me no more because of God's grace, amen. My God, my God, my God. And I'm here to tell you if somebody's here and sick in body or you need a healing, you're in the right house That's this right. morning. Shaka. I said you're in the right house this morning. God's grace is eternal. Amen. That's all, Pastor. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Anybody in this room amazed by His grace? I'm one of them. I can't get enough. Every day that I live, I need grace. You need grace. I'm still amazed by his grace. Anybody want to take a little bit of time and have some intimacy with God for just a minute and not worry about anybody pushing you to go on through an agenda? How about we just lift our hands for just a moment and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we love when you touch us. We love when you hold us. And we're thankful for grace. My God, where would we be without it? I thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to show us unmerited favor. And Lord, you gave us something we didn't earn, didn't deserve. Oh, it's so amazing. And we bless you. We love you. And Lord, I pray you will anoint your messenger this morning as I preach. Move today. Speak to us today, we pray. We love you. We give you praise in Jesus' holy name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Y'all keep praying. better look out. There's no telling what God might do in this place. I hope you came expecting something wonderful because that's the kind of God we serve. He's wonderful. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm still amazed by His grace. Still amazed by His grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. It means it's God showing you blessings that you did not deserve, didn't earn them. You didn't do anything to gain His favor. Uh, but yet he said, I'll show you grace just because I love you. I'll show you grace just because I'll make you worthy of it through the blood of his son. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, if you'll look to your screens. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I don't remember ever being uh, 
good enough to get a Christmas present on Christmas morning. I, 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 and, and I hope you understand where I'm going here. Even if I'd been a little wild child, I'd probably still had a present because my parents gave me presents because they love me. And, and you give gifts to your children, birthdays, Christmas time, because you love them. You might have one child that's an angel, one child that's something else. Amen, Brother Ben? Might be something else, but guess what? They both get Christmas presents, don't they? Because you love them. You didn't do enough to earn the grace of God. You can't be smart enough, strong enough, good enough, well-dressed enough to deserve the grace of God. He gave you grace because he loved you. So don't go saying, well, I'm just not, I've not been good enough this week to get God's grace. You never were to begin with. Just accept it that God wants to give you his grace. Amen. Hallelujah. He can't wait to give you grace. He said, by grace, you've been saved through faith. I praise God that we're saved this morning. Amen. I want to share a story. This guy's got kind of a different type name. He's from Ghana, G-H-A-N-A, Addison Adamu. Addison Adamu, he was raised in a Muslim home many years ago, and uh, they went five times a day to pray, very committed to pray to Allah, devoted, I mean, uh, Muslims. And so uh, Addison, this young man, started hanging out with some friends who were of a different type of belief called Christianity. Look out, because anytime you interject uh, truth into faults, something that's wrong, you're going to find out truth's going to stand out brightly. And so this young Muslim boy began to go to church with his friend without his father knowing it. And so he would go to church, and guess what he saw? He saw some Holy Ghost-filled saints of the living God that believed in laying hands on the people and that they would be healed. And guess what? There was people, he said, came into the building with crutches, and before they left, he'd never seen nothing like it. They left walking and leaping and jumping. It's like, my goodness, something's real about this Jesus. He said, there's people in wheelchairs. They'd come in a wheelchair. They'd leave running out the door, shouting, praising God. He said, there's got to be something real to this Jesus. And so he gave his heart to Jesus. And after a few years, he quit going to the, um, oh boy, I forgot the name, the Muslim church. What would they get? M mosque, yes. Quit going to the mosque with his daddy. His daddy's like, wait a minute, we're, we're supposed to be going to the mosque. What are you doing? And he says, well, I'm not going there anymore. I've started going to church. His daddy got mad. He pulled out a knife. He started chasing after his son. He said, I'm going to kill you. He said, you've disgraced our family. You've disgraced our religion. And, and if you get away from me, I better never see you again. The boy took off running. He stayed with a group of friends for three weeks. Word came to him that his daddy had mysteriously become paralyzed. Very odd. True story. Paralyzed. Couldn't even talk. So that his father laid in his home on the bed and word came to the son the boy looked around at his friends he said guys we've got to go pray for daddy they said are you crazy they'll kill you and us he said I don't care I've got to go show him that Jesus can heal <laughs> Woo! <laughs> hallelujah his dad laid paralyzed he wasn't just paralyzed the doctor said he is dying if something didn't turn around they didn't know what caused the illness but if something didn't turn around he was not going to make it Story goes on to say that Addison went running into his father's house. He said, Daddy was looking at me, but he couldn't talk. So I decided to say, Dad, I'm here to pray for you. Lord Jesus, he began, I know that you are the healer. Heal my father right now so that the Muslims here and the whole world will know that you are the healer. He said before he could say in Jesus' name, amen, daddy started moving on the bed, sat up, got up, said, son, that Jesus you just prayed in his name, he's real. He just touched my body and made me whole. Guess what happened? Mama ended up getting saved. Uh, step Stepbrother got saved. Stepsister got saved. Uh, it said over and over, it began to spread like wildfire. And God moved through the Addison, Adamu, to spread the gospel in the darkest of places. I am still amazed by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Give him a hand. God's good. The grace of God was instrumental in your and my salvation. 
instrumental. Without God's grace, we would not even have the opportunity to speak the words, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. We couldn't have even acknowledged that truth without God's grace being placed upon us. Grace is something that it doesn't just stop with the sinner's prayer and then you never need it again. You see, I don't know about you, but I need grace every day. Sometimes when I get up on Monday, I'm faced with a situation at work and I, maybe an installer didn't do the job he was supposed to, didn't put the flooring in right, or, or, or maybe a customer doesn't want to pay. Or, and, and I'm like, Lord, I need some grace today. I need some favor that I didn't necessarily earn or deserve. And maybe you relate to that. Maybe on Wednesday you get notes sent home from school and the kids are acting like hoodlums. And you're thinking, Lord, I need some grace today. <laughs> To know how to deal with this. Maybe on Friday you got uh, all kind of bills piled up in the, on the table and the uh, paycheck got cut because you, maybe you missed half a day on Thursday because a kid was sick at school and you had to go pick them up and you lost some of your pay. You're thinking, Lord God, i got to have a miracle. Bill's still coming, but the pay's less than it was. You need grace every day. And we serve a God who's willing to give you that grace. What else can grace do for us? Well, number one, grace justifies us in Romans 3.24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He makes you as if you never committed a sin, never broke a law, never did anything to transgress against what he asked you to do. He makes you appear that way before himself. He says, when I place grace upon you, it's going to be like you've never sinned one time. He justifies you. In Romans 15, 15, grace gives us boldness. Now, I've had some people in the last few months saying, I need some boldness. I need to gain strength and, and be able to witness to people the way I want to. When I, I'm in church with you, Pastor, I feel so strong, but then I get around people and I feel different. I, I don't feel as strong. I don't feel that presence as much. And but God says that the grace that he offers in Romans 15, 15, it will give you boldness to witness. It will give you boldness to stand up when the devil's coming against you with everything he's got, with both barrels loaded and a cannon and a missile launcher and a, a B-52 bomber from the devil. And, and you, you look at him and say, I know it looks bad. I know it seems like I'm not going to pull out of this, but in the name of Jesus, God's grace gave me the boldness to tell you that I'm going to rebuke you and you've got to flee, devil. That's boldness. You can't do that in the flesh. You'll get kicked all over your front yard by a demon if you try uh, going after him in the flesh. You need the power of God in you Amen. to overcome the devil. Amen. His grace will do that for you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Grace is strength for the weak. It says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Can I get a testimony of that? <laughs> where sin abounded in your and my life grace abounded so much more he trumped every uh, attack of the devil everything the devil rose up as evidence in the courtroom of heaven against you God says oh but I got enough grace to refute everything you say against the devil they're my child therefore they've got grace hallelujah grace enables people to preach in Ephesians 3 and 8 you couldn't even preach right without the grace of God on you Number six, the grace of God led Jesus to sacrifice everything he had. Hebrews 2 and 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. It was only by God's grace that Jesus was able to sacrifice himself for all of our sins. The grace of God goes a lot farther than you probably thought when you just heard the song Amazing Grace. Grace is wrapped all up in your life, intermingled in your bowl of cereal. It's uh, when, you, when you get up and you put on your clothes and you look in the mirror, there's grace wrapped all around you for that day. When you go to work or go to school, uh, there's grace in your uh, $6 million man Care Bear lunchbox. <clears throat> they don't make one that's got both. I just covered both genders. There's grace all in your sack lunch. There's grace all over you when you're in the, the company truck and you're driving, delivering furniture or, or working on a car or whatever you're doing. There's grace everywhere you go. Well, that's the kind of God we serve. He don't want to be a God that hangs out at New Haven or any other church and says, well, I'll wait on you to get back. Have a good week. He goes with you. The grace of God is amazing because it does not leave you. Everywhere you go, you're going to see God's grace. According to 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 12, God's grace allows us to be glorified 
in Jesus Christ. Now, there's something we don't deserve. We don't deserve to be glorified. We're nothing. We're just mere humans, sinful human beings. But God says, I'm going to take you, wash you, make you new, and make you presentable, and cover you with glory of my own self. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, and I'm sure I can get a lot of amens from you, that my life hasn't always been what I wanted. I didn't get, uh, you know, those... Um, Machines, like especially when you go to school, go to the hospital or somewhere, and maybe at where you work, the vendor machines, you get your uh, peanut packs and uh, paydays and snicker bars and chips. Come on, somebody. Anybody licking your lips? Butterfingers? Mm, I went to um, the prayer walk at the schools, and I thought, boy, things have changed. I was, man, when I was in school, we had Reese Cup. Come on, get an amen on that. We had uh, Snickers, Butterfinger, Baby Ruth, uh, any kind of junk you can imagine. And now I go and they got all these health bars. I look in there, I'm thinking, what in the world? You got <coughs> vegetarian crackers and uh, special chips that are baked instead of uh, however else they fix them with all the grease and stuff. But you know the baked kind. And I'm thinking, man, they got all these granola bars. Man, where's a good snicker when you need one, amen? <laughs> but they're trying to make sure our kids eat healthy. <laughs> Hallelujah, pray I can get back on my topic here. I'm going on a tangent. Woo! <clears throat> I know where I was going. I was thinking, when I look at my life, it hasn't always been as easy as pushing A1 and, and the uh, candy bar sliding down and falling. I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I wanted. Most of the time, I'm pushing A1, C5 falls out. <clears throat> can I get an amen? Amen. Now, if you have H567 drop out, there's something wrong with that machine. <clears throat> or it's a big machine. When I choose what I want, I don't always get it. Or if I ask for what I want. When you ask God for things, sometimes he knows if you got what you asked for, you'd be in a bigger mess than you are right now. So he says, I'm going to give you C4 when you're praying for A1. Amen. You'd have to hear this message to even know what I say. That, that'd be one of them situations like with Donald Trump where they, sh they play that one clip and everybody's like, what in the world is he preaching on? You're going to get C4 when you pray for A1. Hallelujah. <clears throat> what does that mean? There's been times I had to have surgery when I prayed to be healed. Boy, that'll teach you faith right there. You want to get on a bandwagon where you ain't got enough faith because God ain't healed you? Man, I, I try to be very careful about what. Matter of fact, I don't go there. I don't get judgmental with people and say you don't have enough faith because God allows us to face things where we can pray fast, have the saints anoint us with all. We can quote every scripture about healing. We can go for days declaring healing over our bodies. And sometimes we might not be healed. Sometimes God allows doctors and nurses and medicine to help us. I remember preaching about, well, it might have been last Sunday morning. I can't remember. But I remember standing up here saying that I was so pleased with Aaron Bowley because he had gone at least a week, a week and a half in extreme pain and that he had prayed for God to heal him. We had prayed for God to heal him. And nothing up to that night had happened. And still, he was faithful. He, stepped, he, he kept saying the same uh, testimony he always had. He kept loving Jesus. Oh, I'm sure there was times he got a little down. But he kept uh, staying strong in his faith. Amen. And then what happened Sunday night? Bam. God touched you. You're healed. And you're walking around like a normal person. You're finally normal, brother. Hallelujah. He's finally normal after this many years. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We don't always get what we want. Thank God. We don't always get what we ask for. But if you pray according to his will, you're going to see God start moving some mountains. You pray according to his will, you're going to see blessings coming in the door. When you pray according to his will, you're going to find out that you look at people different than you did last week because last week you might have been focused more on how you felt about the situation. And God says, get out of thinking how you think and think how I think and start loving them the way I love them. Amen. Whoa, there's a word. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When I'm weak, when I'm weak, he said his grace would be sufficient for us. Man, there's a whole message just in that one verse. His grace is always more than enough. Amen. You know, grace is something you can count on when you can't count on yourself. See, there's been way too many times Michael Knight thought he was the stuff. <clears throat> if you grew up in the 80s, you know what that means. <clears throat> thought I was the stuff and the anointed one, you know, whatever you want to say. 
show off the trophies. I try not to get that way, but there's times everybody deals with that mess. I thought I was a stuff, and something comes, knocks me down, and I realize, whoa, wait a minute. I'm not always walking in a, a, a goosebump type of atmosphere. I'm not always feeling like people like me. I, there's times where I face troubles and trials, and I don't like it. God began to show me my grace is sufficient, Michael. My grace is sufficient, Hubbards and Hughes and, and Penrods and Wilsons and Millers and Watts and Jeffers and Finleys and all the others. My grace is sufficient for your family. No matter what you face, I'll be there. I'll help you. I'll rescue you when you don't even deserve it. That's the way God is. He loves us. Sometimes I can't count on myself and you can't count on yourself to do the best thing, but God's grace is still sufficient for you. Hallelujah to the Lamb. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, second part of verse 10, for when I am weak, then I'm strong. You probably uh, have lived this out before in your life. When you felt the weakest, that's when God showed up and, and you began to realize, my faith was greater than I thought. My faith was stronger than I thought. Yes, we depended on God. Yes, we had to have his help and his power. But the faith and grace he put upon us and in us was greater than we realized. We could not have understood the limits or maybe the un unlimited ability of God's grace and power unless he had allowed it to be tested in us. Thank God he trusted you to be tested because he proved to you that his grace was sufficient. One of the stories that I absolutely love to teach and preach about is the woman who was thrown at the feet of Christ and she was called in adultery and it's found in John chapter 8. We're going to begin reading that with verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst I want to stop there. We're going to continue in just a moment. When, he had, when they set her in the midst, that means that there was a group of people around her. Now the story goes on to tell us those people were not for her. They were against her. Their desire was to see her dead within about five to ten minutes. This woman sinned, caught in adultery, according to the law of Moses. She deserves death. We've come to condemn her. But what do you have to say about it first, Jesus? Here's a woman thrown down in the midst. I want to emphasize that phrase, in the midst, because too many of us have felt that same feeling where that there's an army rising against us. Sometimes we feel like there's a group of people who are, are, are trying to destroy us, and we're thinking, what in the world's going on here? And, and this woman, she knew she was guilty. See, that's rough when you know you're guilty. When you know you're guilty, that means you can throw out all arguments, all debates, uh, judgments coming. There's nothing good that can come of this. I'm a dead woman is probably what she was thinking. But she was thrown in the midst of people who were agging on her own death. Understand this, that when you're caught in the midst of those who would want to destroy you, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for you. If God be for you, if God be for you, who can be against you? Here's a woman that's caught. She's guilty. She deserves death. And she's thrown in the midst. There is a crowd around her who is not rooting for her. They're not saying, well, I hope she make it, makes it. They're not pulling out 15 denarii and flipping coins and saying, hey, I'll bet 10 denarii that they're going to kill her. And, and if, if I miss this, we'll do double your money. No, there's nobody rooting for her. Nobody's giving her a shot. And then here's Jesus Christ. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up. Look at your neighbor and say, he raised himself up. And said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. This woman understood that she was guilty. This was also a woman who at this moment had no hope of grace. All she knew at this moment was law. I faced no hope. Law is against me. There is no grace. Now, that's what's going on in her mind. There's no opportunity for rescue. There's no reprieve. There's no pardon. 
No chance she's going to survive these next few minutes. Here's a woman that's been thrown down before them. Now, I want you to think about this. I, I like trying to get in people's heads. Some of you are probably going to be afraid to set up meetings with me in my office from now on. But if you, I don't, I'm not going to manipulate you, but I, when I tell a Bible story, I like to get into their heads. And I try to think what they were thinking. And if I'm her, <clears throat> first thing I'm thinking of, well, I can't even trust a man, so why should I put any trust in that guy they're calling Jesus? Men's mistreated me. Men have used me. Men have abused me. <clears throat> as a man I was in the arms of just a few minutes ago and he said he loved me and he would support me and be with me but they stripped me out of his arms brought me and threw me at the feet of Jesus and where is he now? I can't trust a man they turn on you they betray you they cheat on you this guy who well that's true I was cheating myself because I was in adultery but at least I thought he'd be faithful to me here she is in the dirt staring at the ground and if she's able to gain the strength to lift up her eyes and see Jesus, why should she expect anything different from Jesus than she did the guy that she was just with or these men who have picked up stones and they're ready to kill her? Why should I expect anything different? Surely he won't protect me if these other men that I've known for years won't. But then something interesting happened. The Bible said in the scripture we just read that Jesus had lowered himself and written in the dirt, but then the Bible says he raised himself up. Let me tell you what Jesus was doing. He was doing what that lover that she thought she could depend on didn't do. She was doing what these Pharisees couldn't do. She was doing what no other man probably had ever done. Jesus was standing up for her. Woo, hallelujah. Grace was standing up for the undeserving. Grace was standing up on behalf of somebody who deserved death. Grace was standing up when me and you were caught in sin and we deserved death, hell, and the grave. And God said, no, I'll stand in the gap for them and I'll raise up the standard of the cross of Calvary and I'll let the devil know, yes, they deserve death. Oh, but I'm lifting up the standard. Get thee behind me, Satan. This one's bought with the blood. Grace stood up for this woman. The reason that we relate so well to this lady is because so many of us have our own stories of when grace stood up for us. The look on the men's faces changed when they discovered that that law they were so adamant about would now cut both ways. For Jesus stood up, or I'm sorry, and again, verse 8, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. What did he write? We don't know. It's been surmised many times, guessed at. People have tried to come up with ideas. But whatever Jesus was doing, it was making a difference in the situation. This woman, think about this now. This woman could have blamed everybody else but herself. If that man had stayed with his wife and would have quit flirting with me, I wouldn't be in this mess. If that nosy neighbor had kept her nose in her own business instead of peeking in my window when I was with that guy I wasn't supposed to be with, I wouldn't be in this mess. It's her fault. Nosy Nelly. Why couldn't she just let me do I wouldn't hurt nobody. Why couldn't she just let me do my own thing, enjoy my sin? No, nosy Nelly had to tell. Or what if it's God's fault? Who is God to think he can tell me I can't be with the person I love? Oh, look out now. Uh-oh. If I love that person, doesn't that mean I should be able to be with them? If, the, if, if people agree with me and they think we look better together than that guy and his wife? It's going to blow your mind. There's some people hook up in adultery going to church. They say, well, his wife ain't spiritual enough. He needs a godly woman. I'm going to be spiritual, I'm going to carry my Bible, and then we're going to sleep together on Fridays. <laughs> what? That's crazy. People actually think that way. So here you got a woman who could have blamed everybody else. And guess what she did? She didn't say a word because she knew all those arguments were in vain. There's nobody today right here in the dirt when I see the temple about, uh, well, I'm right here in the temple. And when, when I see people around me and they're grumbling and they're talking about what a sorry dog I am, you know what? 
I'm the one that's to blame. I'm not even going to lift up a rebuttal. I'm not going to offer a defense. I have no attorney and I will not stand on behalf of my own self because I know I'm guilty and I deserve what's coming to me. She sits there in the dirt knowing I'm just a few minutes away from getting what I really earned, what I deserved. But what she didn't know was that God opened up this window that God allowed her to be put on this path, that God allowed somebody to uh, find out about her adultery and bring her to the foot of Jesus because God was going to show her what it looked like when you became face, uh, when you got face to face with grace. That's what was happening right now. For as she lifted up her eyes and she looked into the eyes of one who she couldn't really understand and didn't know what angle he had in this whole thing and didn't know where he was coming from, yet when she looked in the eyes of Jesus, she came face to face with the grace that it would take to save her life. Grace is still available today. Romans 5 and 12, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Let's go on with our story in verse 9. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing. Somebody say standing. Mm. When you come face to face with grace, it doesn't finish its work in your life until you are left standing. She came covered with with guilt, thrown in dirt, undeserving, unworthy. The only thing she deserved was, was justice and punishment. She was down probably close to on her knees, maybe on her hands, maybe near her face. But before grace was through, the Bible let us know that it picked her up and she was standing before it was all over. I want to tell you a story about a young man I want to make sure the age before I tell you. 14 year old. John Smith, kind of a common name. It was his true name. John Smith. February 4th, 2015. This story came out on USA Today.com. February 4th, 2015. This young man somehow fell into ice. It must have been a, a lake or pond. And he was under the water for 15 minutes. He literally died because of the freezing temperatures and it shut his body down when they found him they drug him out of the water rushed him to the hospital and then for 27 more minutes not counting the ride to the hospital for 27 more minutes this young man John Smith was dead no matter what they did no CPR no shock pads nothing could bring him back and so the doctor said, I'm going to bring the mother in and I'm going to let her know the news. It was odd because I've been in situations like this and they normally don't bring you in to where the body is. But for some reason, the doctor allowed her to come in. It might have been just the age of her son and knowing that she would want to see him and touch him. The doctor invited Mama to come into the surgery room. Her name was Joyce Smith. And he said, what happened next defied explanation. Joyce Smith was interviewed, the mother, and they said, what did you do? She said, I began to pray. She placed her hand on it, and she said, Holy God, please send your Holy Spirit to save my son. I want my son. Please save him. While she was praying, one of the nurses screamed out, We've got a pulse. We've got a pulse. The doctors rushed the mother out. She was shouting, giving glory to God, and they began to work with the young man. He came too. He was alive. There was nothing wrong. They said, well, we expected at least some brain damage, but as tests have been ran, they said he is functioning normally and recovering. God is healed and delivered and resurrected that young man. Dr. Garrett said, it's a bona fide miracle. Dr. Kent Suterer said, that when he was writing words about the miracle, he, he got to the point where that the mama prayed and he said these words. That's when his heart was jump-started by the Holy Spirit, listening to the request of a praying mother. Grace did not stop until that boy John Smith was left standing. When God comes with his grace to you, he will not leave. Of course, he said he'll never leave or forsake you, but he won't finish the work of grace for that moment until you are left standing upright in your spirit, man, and ready to take on another battle. 
That's the way God moves in our lives. His grace is sufficient. I'm still amazed, church. I'm still amazed by the grace of God. That is a story from this year. We're not talking about Bible days. 2015, February this year. God did a miracle. Continue with verse 10. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The woman had to have some instruction. Just showing her grace wasn't enough. Just saying you're forgiven wasn't enough. She had to have instruction for the days of head. So, uh, so what did Jesus do? He told her a two-letter word. He said, go. See, church, he's been talking to us for quite some time. He's been telling us, New Haven, go. Don't just get caught in the moment of, of ecstasy and amazing grace. Don't get caught up in the move of the Holy Ghost. Don't get caught up with your healing. Don't get caught up with the goosebumps and the great music you might hear. He said, you've got to go. You can't stay where you are. You've got to move forward. You've got to go and reach others with this gospel that you're hearing from this pulpit, that you're hearing from your Sunday school and Wednesday night classes. You've got to go, he said. Go and sin no more. Go tells us, and he, that same command is for us. Go tells us that there's a job that you've got to do that nobody else can do except you. Don't you depend on mama, daddy, sister, brother, husband, wife, children. Nobody can do your job except you. You know, it, it affects an entire assembly line with one person decides, I'm going to take a break when it's not break time. One person's putting a part on a, a car part, and it's going down a conveyor belt, and they say, oops, I just decided I don't feel like doing this for the next five minutes. It's going to affect everybody else down the road. Church, we are so close to the coming of the Lord. You don't have time to take a break from ministry. You don't have time to take a break from your calling. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. You don't have time to take a break from doing what God called you to do 15 years ago. God has given a word today. It's time to go. It's time to go. It's time to go. It's time to go. It's time to go, it's time to go God says. you got to move. you got to affect others. You've got to make a difference because nobody has the anointing that you've got on your life. No one can touch others the way that God designed you to touch those people. Go, he said. Then he gave her an awesome word before Calvary, before the three days of burial, before resurrection. He gave this woman a command that some people don't even think you can do now. But Jesus wouldn't tell you to do it if he wouldn't give you the grace to do it. He said, go and sin no more. I believe you can live a victorious life as a child of the king. I believe no temptation can overtake you except such as coming to man. But God's faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will uh, enable you to always be able to bear it. He said he will always give you a means of escape. Always. That means you can overcome every single time you're tempted, church. He said, go and sin no more. Go, do what you're called to do. But make sure you live a life of holiness in front of this world so they can see what Christ really looks like. Go and sin no more. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Grace unlocks the potential to sin no more. If I ended the message right now, I'd be robbing you partially because there's something very important about grace that must be connected with this word. Grace was only able to take the place of the law because of what Jesus did on the cross. Grace is empowered by the work of the cross. The work of grace is enabled by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And you have unmerited favor, which is grace. Because Jesus stood between you and me and the wrath of God. Grace is nothing without Calvary. It's important that I say that this morning because there's a lot of preachers preaching a word that's grace only without Calvary. Grace without sacrifice is meaningless. Grace without the cross is, in, is non-existent. There is no such thing as grace of God if you don't have sacrifice of Christ to go along with it. Grace only comes through what Jesus did for us. He offered himself. He offered you grace because he died for your sins. Grace is enabled by Golgotha's heel and the act that took place upon it. 
The same Jesus who stood up on the adulterous woman's behalf allowed himself to be raised up on your behalf. He stood that day when he was in the temple, but there was another day where he was raised up on a cross. He was stood upright, and that cross fell in the deep cavern of the earth in the top of that skull called Golgotha. And on that day, Jesus allowed himself to stand up for you. He knew you wouldn't be perfect. He knew that there was times you was going to fail. He knew that you were going to be sorry sinners at one point of your life, but he said, I'll still stand on your behalf. So when you're not able to trust other people, you'll be able to trust me. See, there's some pastors you can't trust. Oh, my goodness. There's some pastors who go spill their guts. You go to them in confidence. They'll tell everything you tell them. And you're thinking, man, how's half the church know what I said? He's the only one I talked to. Well, it's because you can't trust them. There's some worship leaders, some youth pastors, some, uh, some teachers who you can't trust. But that's the minority. Most of them you can. Most of them are God-fearing people. They wouldn't even be doing it to begin with. But I wanted to make a point. Because I want you to know that even if you've been hurt by church people who should have been the most trustworthy people on the planet, you can still trust the one who will always stand up for you even in your worst of moments. He lifted himself up when you were unworthy and undeserving of his grace. He said, I'll stand up every time for you. You question my love for you, go back and remember that moment. Pull out that Polaroid picture in your mind. Print it out and you see me hanging on that cross for you. Remind yourself of what I did for you. Every time, he'll stand up on your behalf. Stand with me today, church. God's grace cannot run out. It's just as powerful this week as last week. The grace that God showed your great-grandparents is still just as powerful today. Let's bow our heads. Holy Spirit of the living God, direct us now as we have this altar service. Lord God, we don't want to leave here unless you're finished. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. Holy are you, God. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. simple altar call this morning. I feel the Lord saying to me that there are some people who would just like to talk to me this morning, Michael. I want you to give them an opportunity to come down and just meet with me for a while. If that's your desire, if you say, and I know you could pray where you're standing, but if there's some people who you just feel like this is my time, I need to come just get an altar. There's some things I want to talk to the Lord about. God's going to talk to me. And just come on up and just spend some minutes with the Lord. Enjoy His presence. Amen. He might be telling you some things that you didn't expect. Yeah, hallelujah. Let the Lord hear you this morning.